Simone Show here with another session of Get Schooled. Are you ready to learn about WDM aggregation networks? Well, let's start this off nice and easy. Because we never do anything nice and easy. We always do it nice and rough. But we're schooling, 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 schooling on the iPod. It's time for today's pop quiz. When moving out to the edge of the network and the aggregation portion of the network, what are some of the roadblocks? Is it A, location and space, B, technological limitations, or C, size, cost, and power consumption? Think this one over carefully. The right answer could mean the difference between genius and the back of the class. Sit back, relax, it's time to get school. Hello and welcome to Get School. I'm Dave Morfus and I'm here today with Malcolm Toynbee and the topic today is WDM aggregation networks. I think the first thing we need to talk about is bandwidth. On the residential side we see bandwidth from triple play demand going into the maybe 100 megabit per second range and probably beyond. In the enterprise side, on the business side, we see business services like managed wavelengths pushing into the tens of gigabits per second. So what effects are we seeing on those networks? Whether you're a traditional service provider or a cable company, it's video that's driving the bandwidth up in the core part of the network coming in through the access side. And not just, not just regular video, right? High definition televisions have uh, outsold regular televisions, so it's the HD content driving up the bandwidth, personalized TV, network DVR. All these combined together are basically driving up increased amounts of bandwidth. And to keep up with this, service providers and cable companies have to look at new technologies and new ways to plan and deliver those services. On the enterprise side, you're seeing things like uh, Wall Street financial firms asking for multiple wavelength service, you know, up into the tens of gigabits. Disaster recovery scenarios for data centers also asking for multiple wavelengths and diverse routes into their, you know, premises. We have uh, the phenomenon of YouTube that a lot of people are familiar with. Their service provider has to give them multiple wavelengths. Uh, they've reported peak data rates on their servers upward towards 75 gigabits per second. And so today they're getting multiple wavelengths from their service provider and they're asking for the industry to drive towards 100 gigabits per second for a single wavelength. One of the challenges that we're seeing is that users, whether they're enterprise users or residential users, are demanding more bandwidth but they're not willing to pay anymore. So what challenges does that provide to the service providers and the MSOs? They have to deliver more and more bandwidth to the home, whether that's residential bandwidth, you know, in the video case we were talking about earlier, or enterprise customers that demanding you know, tens and tens of gigabits or multiple managed waves. Um, so they can't just make decisions any longer based on first cost. They need to keep their eye on that. It's still important. But at the same time, they need to make choices uh, based on technology and transport architectures that address the total cost of ownership and meet this bandwidth explosion and growth with a pathway to scale to future bandwidth. The benefits of Rotom and multiple network element integration have certainly made their home in the core of the network. What roadblocks are there or what stops that functionality from moving out to the edge of the network and the aggregation portion of the network? Traditionally, the block or if you want to call it the barrier to entry for that technology into the, either the edge part of a larger network or into smaller networks where they feel they're not sure if they can justify Rotom technology has been both size, cost, and power consumption. For a couple of years now, our customers have enjoyed the benefits of Rotom technology and what we call ADM on a blade, or some people refer to as MSPP on a blade, where you take what was one separate network element functionality, you know, whether that's next-gen ADM or layer two switching, and instead of separate stack boxes just taking up a lot of space and very hard to manage, you take that and shrink that down into a couple pairs of cards and integrate that with the Rotom technology, allowing the cable operator, the service provider, deliver their services very efficiently and quickly. How does the Telab 7100 Nano Optical Transport System address these needs as well as what benefits does it provide to the network? So one of the big accomplishments that we've done here at Telabs is we've taken 
the all the features of the current product that we have today in the uh, 7100 multi-degree rotum and basically transferred all those features into uh, the 7100 nano at about a third the size and it consumes a lot less power. At the same time we use all the same service delivery modules that are currently available today. You know the ADM on a blade which is basically a multi-service provisioning platform card that you can provision any service on any port at any given time and all done through software. Key prerequisites too for moving out into the edge of the network with Rotom technology or addressing networks that are a little bit smaller is size, cost, and power. And the 7100 Nano addresses all three of those in a big way. Telab 7100 Nano has the ability to carry 44 wavelengths at 10 gigabits per second, identical to the current you know, multi-degree Rotom product that we have today. It's part of the same family. They interop in the network seamlessly at the optical level. The Nano can basically drop or add eight protected wavelengths at a network element today, and it does it in a fashion that some people within the industry call colorless add drop. And, and what I mean by that is I can basically software program each individual wavelength that I want to add and drop. And for whatever reason, at a later date, if I wanted to, I could go back and reconfigure that from the network operation center to software. I don't have to make any other physical connections. In the future, we're going to basically have the ability to expand that to 16 protected add or drop wavelengths. And then along with that ability for you know, bandwidth protection investment, if you want to call it that, each wavelength come next year when we introduce our new 40 gig transponder could be carrying traffic at 40 gigabits per second times 44 wavelengths through the nano without any changes to the network whatsoever. The nano is 40 gig ready today, just like the current product. You're good, aren't you? The answer is C. Brilliant. Now, if you missed the answer, your homework is to download a cheat sheet at inspirethenewlife.com. And, you know, you can go home, grab a mic, and sing it out. Because we're schooling, schooling on the iPod. Whew. <laughs>